Okay, continuing our materials informatics series, talking more about generative models, let's come to diffusion models. Now diffusion models are the current state of the art, in my opinion, in terms of generative models. They are incredible. They are typically outperforming GANs and VAEs and other approaches. So how do they work? Let's dive into it. Okay, so diffusion models, they are responsible for all of the stuff you see here. Uh, things like Midjourney, Dolly 3, Gemini, uh, oof, Adobe Firefly. A lot of these things are relying on diffusion models. But if you actually dive into how they actually work for material science, we're starting to use them there as well. In fact, here's a paper from my own research group that came out earlier this year. And we can see it's just one of several different papers in this area where we're starting to see that diffusion models are really powerful tools for predicting things related to material science. In this case, new crystal structures, but it could be new microscopic images or lots of other th different things, right? So how do they work? Um, to understand them, there's really four key papers that if you're really wanting to dive into this are gonna be useful for you to take a look at, right? There's the first one, which is deep unsupervised learning using non-equilibrium thermodynamics. Uh, this is the first one. This is one where they start to introduce this idea of diffusing an image, hence the, the, the terminology non-equilibrium thermodynamics, right? Then comes improved denoising diffusion probabilistic models. And finally, diffusion models beat GANs on image synthesis. So we're gonna draw from the things that were uh, instructed in these original papers in the next following couple of slides. So first off, um, diffusion models work in a totally different way from GANs and VAEs. They're kind of similar to VAEs in that there's this idea that you have real images and then we're compressing it to a latent space and then we're figuring out how to go back to the real image. It's kind of like that, but where the VAE simply used a reduction in the number of nodes of a neural network until it squoze it into a, a latent space, we are now going to do something different. We're going to learn how to iteratively destroy our model right, by adding Gaussian noise and once it's purely Gaussian noise at this point, xt, right? You start out with a real image over here and it ended up at xt by the time it got to the end. We then learn how to recover the image by denoising it, by, re by reversing this process essentially, right? And obviously this could be applied to images, um, but also audio or text, right? It's the same sort of approach can be applied to all these different types of data sets. So this forward process, let's talk about that first. Here we're going to learn how to gradually add noise to your data until you end up with a transformed image after a series of steps. We're gonna call it capital T, right? Mathematically, this is uh, known as applying a known diffusion process, hence the name of non-equilibrium thermodynamics, right? Uh, and that gets modeled after Gaussian noise, okay? At each step, the idea is that you're gonna make your image a little bit more random with each step, following some predefined schedule, more on that in a moment, until it's reached truly random noise. Um, what's great about this is that this process is pretty easy to define and control because you're just adding noise to your image. The trick is in this reverse process, right? This is learning to denoise. And this is kind of where the magic actually happens here, right? Here the model is learning the reverse diffusion process, right? Going from random noise back to a structured image. And that's a lot harder than just adding noise because it's not just as simple as taking away things randomly. You have to take away the right things that it, such that it preserves the complex patterns and structure that were present in your initial data, right? And so uh, this is done by training on many examples of noisy data at various stages of the diffusion process and learning how to predict how to remove the noise step by step until you've reconstructed your original data. So the catch is that we're gonna do this iteratively. We're going to denoise things iteratively. Like it'd be one thing you could go from this image in the top all the way to noise, right? You can do that and basically uh, you, could, you could apply a mathematical operation that would do that all in one step. But the model is when you come back, there you have to iteratively slowly transform step by step until you reach back to your original image. And once that's trained and you can able to do that with your data, well then instead of taking the noise that comes out of a tra forward transformation, you can take any random noise pass it through your model and reconstruct things that will look like they're from the same, you know, type of distribution of data that you started with, in, in this case, maybe landscapes. Okay, so in other words, the input, if it's a picture of something and that needs to go to an output, which is noise, and that needs to be the same size. Well, if you saw our previous video on image segmentation, where we talked about units, same size coming in, same size coming out, units are gonna be a natural choice for that. So we're going to use the unit as a denoising unit shown right here, right? 
So what goes into this unit? Well, the current version of the image, we're gonna do this step by step, and the timestamp, right? We're gonna keep track of which, which version is it that's going through. Those are the two inputs, in, in, inputs into this process, right? Now we need to keep track of the time steps because during the forward diffusion pass, different amounts of information are removed at different steps. And so what we need to learn how to do is how to put that context back in at different intervals as well. So mathematically, the way to achieve this, it's actually easier if we just learn to predict the noise itself. In other words, we would really like to be able to say like, predict me all of the noise for some arbitrary time step and then simply remove it to get back to the image. Otherwise, we're gonna have to do many, many steps to figure out how to get the right T, right? And then to generate random images, we're gonna start at some high T step, and if we are simply asked to remove noise to what an original image would look like, we're just gonna do this iteratively until we get back to some uh, original looking image, right? So let's see the math for this. The way that we do the forward process, it gets modeled as a Markov chain. Right? So we are going to gradually add data over some fixed number of steps, capital T, right? Therefore, our original data, which was X at some time zero, it's going to be transformed in, by this process to a series of data, right? We now have a series of versions of our data where it's going to exist at X zero, X T minus one, X T, some arbitrary value, all the way up to capital T, right? We're going to have a large number of steps of the data being transformed. And each step of this transformation, we look at it mathematically as being, okay, the value at some step in this process, t, is gonna be equal to the square root of one minus beta t, where beta is our variance schedule, more than a second, times what the previous image looked like. The step at x t minus one gets multiplied by this variance schedule, basically. And then we're going to get, adding to that, our variance schedule square root times epsilon t, where epsilon t is just the noise which is drawn from a Gaussian distribution, okay? So what do we use for this predefined variance schedule? Well, you've got a lot of options, right? It's, it's certainly very important because it's what dictates how much change happens in your image uh, throughout the process of each one of these steps, right? It's typically small. You don't want to do dramatic changes. You want to do small changes and let them maybe get larger over time. And the process whereby that happens can be fixed or it could be learned from a neural network. But the idea is that you want to, cum the cumulative effect of adding all these things should be the overall noise at the, at the final step, right? And if chosen correctly, then this variance schedule should ensure that XT, your final step, you should be left with just an isotropic Gaussian. Uh, and this happens at some sufficiently large number of steps T. So originally they did linear steps, right? And you can see that really quickly, if you add noise in a linear amount, your image rapidly disappears. And so scaling it back was kind of a wise way. This was an open AI paper that did this to destroy your image more slowly, which makes it easier to unlearn it as well, because it's sort of a more uh, uh, reasonable amount of change happening each step rather than trying to learn it all at once. Okay. So then the reverse process is simply trying to recover that original data and the steps mathematically look as follows, right? Now, in order to get an image at x t minus one, that's gonna be equal to one over one minus the square root of one minus your variance schedule, beta t. This all multiplied by whatever your previous step was, x t. Then we're going to minus from that one over the square root of one minus alpha t, which is just one minus the variance schedule, multiplied by, here it is, epsilon theta of x and t and t. So what is that? That is your neural network, right? That is your unit, right? That is a model which is parameterized by theta, right? All the different parameters that go into that denoising unit. Um, that allows us to get to each iterative previous step until we come back to our original image. Therefore, training the diffusion model is about training it based on the noise, right? The training objective is going to be to minimize the difference between the true noise, epsilon t, and the noise that is predicted by our model, epsilon theta, of the previous step and some time step, okay? So we can do this lots of different ways, but typically it's gonna be something like a mean squared error. We're trying to minimize that loss, okay? All right, so given that mathematical description, there's another way of doing this, and why would you bother? Because you can also do this in a probabilistic framework. So you might be saying like, well, we are, I, I liked my math from before. I don't wanna do probabilities, but there's a reason. Bear with me, I'll explain why. If you treat this in a probabilistic framework, it actually gives you an advantage. So it's gonna be very similar, right? Essentially what it's trying to do, these are conditional probabilities, right? In other words, what's the probability of getting position uh, image XT 
given, that's what the bar means here, right? The bar in this equation right here, the vertical bar means what's the probability of achieving some value at xt given that you knew the value at the previous step? Well, it's just going to be, it's going to be the pre, it's going to be the value. It's going to be what the previous value was. It's going to be the variance schedule um, and the identity matrix, right? So that's not too bad. So it's a conditional probability. Figuring out what the image will look like at step t, all we need to know if we knew the value at t minus 1, it's coming from a normal distribution where we're given the, the mean right, and the covariance. right? You knew what the value should be, and you know what the variance ought to be. right? So in other words, this expresses xt as a conditional Gaussian. The mean becomes this 1 minus beta t multiplied by your previous image. And then the variance becomes your beta t, where i, beta t i, where i is the identity matrix. What's slick about this is that, okay, in this process, this, this Markov chain, when you're dealing with probabilistic frameworks, becomes a joint distribution, right? The entire distribution, the sequence from x0 all the way up to x capital T, it's described as a joint distribution, which inside of it, you get factored into the product of conditional distributions due to the Mar Markov property. So you might be thinking like, why do I care about that? What's the benefit here? The benefit is that this allows us to avoid doing it step by step for many steps because mathematically we can do a trick, right? This conditional probability is simply equal to this right there. We can, we can skip all of the steps, um, which is going to be to our advantage here. Then we come to denoising, right? So in denoising, now we're doing the opposite. You're saying, okay, well, what's the probability of getting this t minus 1, given what we knew at the t step, the same thing as before. Okay, that value is going to be equal to something based off of a mean and a covariance. But this time, the mean and the covariance are parameterized by the model. These are learned by training our denoising unit, right? All right. And then the the distribution, since we have a we're now treating things in terms of distributions, we have a different loss function. It becomes evidence lower bound instead of a simply MSE. But it's it's the same approach that we've seen before. What's cool about this is we can also do guided diffusion. So let's say in material science, you introduce a bunch of different crystal structures and you encode them, and then you do this whole process of diffusion where you turn it into ZT or latent space, which is now a random isotropic Gaussian. And then we have our denoising unit, which learns how to go back to a material that looks real. And now you've got new crystal structures, which you could then sort by stability or whatever else. But you can also condition it. What if instead of just making new materials, you guide it based off of properties or synthesizability or stability or chemical or structural novelty? We're starting to see things, including work from my own research group at the University of Utah, where that conditioning becomes proper uh, possible so that we can generate not just random materials from our distribution, but specific materials that match your design criteria. Okay? So there's different ways that we can do guided diffusion, right? Uh, a lot of this comes from this paper, Diffusion Models Beat GANs on Image Synthesis. So for example, uh, this was first proposed in that paper, and it can be conditioned off of anything, text, image, class label, whatever you want, right? So let's consider class label for a moment. If you train a classifier to predict a class given some x and t, right? For example, just like we can train a, a neural network to predict, is there a dog in this picture or not? Like that's the label, like dog versus cat, right? And then you take your classifier and you train it on noisy images. The noise prediction becomes theta, epsilon theta minus one minus alpha t, the gradient x of t log f of the conditional probability of y given x t, right? So this is called classifier guidance. In other words, the noise becomes about maximizing the likelihood of a class label prediction for some given x of t input, okay? What's kind of cool is that you didn't actually have to have a separate classifier model to do this. This was also proposed in that paper. Um, they avoid training a separate classifier, and they instead, they take a class label Y during training, but during training, they replace that label Y with a null label. And then during sampling, they basically compare the performance um, of what it should be versus what it actually did with the null label. So this is called classifier-free guidance. There's other ways that you could do this um, guided diffusion process. Right, so uh, you could use text, for example, and this was shown in the Glide paper. Essentially here what they're doing is they're using clip as a measure of similarity between a text input and an image input. So this was a pre-trained network where they had images and text descriptions of them. Then they take the dot product between the image and the text, and this is used as the score for the gradient. 
and then in Glide, they retrain clip on noisy images, right? So you can see the example of this. Uh, on the Y label here, you see you know, a corgi in a field, and then you've got three different models performing here. You've got corgis uh, using unnoised clip, you've got it with noise clip, and then the final one using the Glide approach, where the big difference there is you know, this classifier-free guidance. And you can see that the original ones are not great, and it's getting better and better with this additional uh, classifier-free guidance. And then the last thing that people are, I'm seeing a lot of in this field is image to image diffusion, where the input is now not just um, text or a property or something, a label. Instead, it's an, in, it's an image that comes in and out comes a, ver, a, a variation of that image, right? So in comes a picture of a person, out comes a picture of that person as a superhero, for example. That's an example of image to image diffusion. So the image becomes our condition, which gets concatenated uh, to this process of diffusion. So. We're starting to see lots of really cool examples. We'll probably do a follow-up video where we apply these just to crystal structure predictions because things like well, our own work, CDBAE, um, MatterGen, <laughs> and others are making a lot of waves. But that's the underlying principle of how diffusion models work. Okay, next up, let's dive into Bayesian inference.